Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm grateful to God for enabling me to come back to my alma mater. That's my former school where I did my ministerial formation from 1989 to 1992. I think, Paul, we, we may be aging. <laughs> Quite a number of you may not have been born by that time. And uh, this is what I look like without a face mask. Next time you meet me, probably COVID will have gone. I may not have a face mask, so you may have a challenge recognizing me. Thank you, University and Chapel Administration, for inviting me to share in this mission week. And thank you, UCU community, for maintaining our university with a good name. Kindly keep it up. As a leader in our church, in various roles, I also serve here on the students' board. I know that our eyes are focused on UCU, that we turn out men and women of good character because we take this university as a nursery bed for raising leaders for our church. Many of our bishops have been trained from here. For our schools, we'd like to see revival in our schools. When you look at the results of USCE, UCE, and I look for the best 50. It is disappointing to find we have about four or five in the best 50 all round of our school. So we are looking to you see you, to raise teachers, to raise head teachers, to raise administrators, men and women of distinction who will make our schools be top once again as it used to be. Amen. You are leaders for hospitals, for a country in commerce and industry, for our civic and political leadership. We are looking to you. That men and women who are shaped and nurtured and raised from here will be the kind who change the equation of corruption. The story of corruption in our public life should stop. And it begins with the change in leadership worldview. So your time here as a student should be very, very well utilized. Because you'll never recover it if you should misuse it. And I'm very, very glad, Mr. Vice Chancellor Sir, that in the university schedule and calendar, you can factor in a week specifically for mission and evangelism. Because there are many things I studied at university, even here, that I've never applied in my work life. But my walk with Christ is a daily experience. So while economics, while this subject and can be compulsory, why not chapel? Why shouldn't chapel be so central in the life of a student, in the life of a worker, a staff of Uganda Christian University? So thank you. Keep it up. Open up in the university lecture rooms, in our places of residence. Even here, when gatherings are invited, attend, 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 because the time may come when you'll never hear such 
unadulterated gospel as it is from God's word. While you are associated with Uganda Christian University, it is our hope and expectation that you'll have an encounter with the Lord of this church, with the Lord of this university. That you'll have an opportunity to hear about him. And that you'll have an opportunity to consider his claims that you'll discover his plans for your life, you'll discover yourself in him, and allow a personal relationship to exist between him and you. And as a result of that, that you'll personally access the benefits that he has all along intended for you if you are in relationship with him. And these benefits are for your good. They meet your needs here. They meet your physical needs. They meet your spiritual needs. They meet your needs in the future. So today, we consider his bold claim about himself that he is the light of the world. This was after he had had a bad time with the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They had brought a woman before him who they said was caught in the very act of adultery. And therefore, if you claim to be a teacher, the law of Moses decrees this, what do you say? They, they had a trap laid out for him. Now Jesus, knowing who being able to tell the mind and the thinking of men. You remember the story that he began to write down and then he said, among you, he who is without sin, let him be the first one to cast a stone and hit this woman. Things turned. And that beginning with the greatest to the smallest, they began to move away one by one, one by one, until he was left alone with an ashamed woman. And he turns to her and says, Woman, there's nobody condemning you, passing judgment. I also forgive you. Go and see no more. That woman was liberated. She almost died. But you know, the systems of the world are unfair. If she was caught in the very act of adultery, was she doing it alone? They should have brought the man also. But they didn't bring the man. So did they really catch her in the very act? Or she was just a victim of circumstances? Or they were applying selective justice. Oh, you see, that is the world. The world which is in darkness will be unfair and will not play the game of life according to the rules. So Jesus makes this bold claim that I am the light of the world. This is in addition to the many titles we find him being referred to in the Bible. Elsewhere, he is called the Good Shepherd, one who takes care of the flock, you and me, if we accept to be in his fold. He takes care of us in a very good way. He leads us to waters still. He leads us to green pastures. He protects us from wild animals and other vagaries of nature. He is a good shepherd. You are better off in his fold. You are better off following his plans. You are better off under his protection and care as a good shepherd. 
Elsewhere, he declared, I'm the bread of life. He who feeds on me, my word, my teaching, will never be hungry. Elsewhere, he's referred to as living waters, the way, the truth, and the life, as the cornerstone, one who, on whose life, on whose position, lives may be anchored. And whatever circumstances that come to shake you, you are secure and safe if your life is anchored on him as a cornerstone. Now, the world without him is in darkness. The world without the light of the world is in darkness. When this is a definite article, the, it's not a, it's not a proposition, it's not an alternative. He is saying, as far as light is concerned, I'm a monopolist here. I'm the only source. There isn't any other. Any other are just empty claims. So when you are in the world without him, the world a system of philosophy or worldview without him is in darkness. When one walks in darkness, either as a result of absence of light or due to a person's blindness, such a person will sustain bruises, they will knock things and objects, they will stumble and fall, they will get broken, they can easily be taken advantage of. There was a man, I don't know if he's come, he was blind for six years, he's a friend of mine. And because of that, he attended a school for the blind, but was resident in a girl's school. He calls himself an OG. But he's a man. And he has this, an experience of walking six years blind. He was supposed to be in secondary school, but because he was now blind, he was demoted to P2. He had to learn how to read and uh, 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 braille. Terrible experience. People despised him. He also feared for his own life. You can either step on poisonous and dangerous snakes. You can't see. You are living a vulnerable existence full of fear, nervousness, limitation. Life is generally closed out on you. You can't enjoy the beauty of colors. You are severely handicapped. There was a man who used to visit our church and stay at our place from Ntungamo. He was blind, but a preacher of the gospel. One time, he shared with my mother something that was painful. He was asking my mother to define the beauty of his wife to him. So my wife, how beautiful is she? Now how do you begin? How do you explain this is the sparkle in her eye? The Pharaoh doesn't even know sparkles. How do you tell this is the texture of her skin, the shape of her legs and, uh, and the cheeks? And how? How? A man who is blind, who has never seen the beauty of his wife. Vulnerable existence. Life has given you a raw deal. It is tough. It is tough. It is tight. You are walking blind. You are severely handicapped. There are some jobs that you can't even dream about. Like being a car driver. Can you even participate in the rally driving? No way. You lose your privacy. Supposing, supposing there's a call of nature. You are guided around. They can cheat you. You can't get your own money. Ah, life is hard for the blind. It is a limited existence. 
when you cannot utilize fully the potential that God invested in you because of lack of sight, because you are blind. Yet Jesus came that we may have life and live it to the full. For you, life has given you a roadblock called blindness. You cannot see. You are limited. Stop there. 20% potential. Jesus, as light of the world, is a real bold claim. He is saying, Pharisees, I know you have misgivings about me. I know you've had this and this and this challenge. The, the biggest challenge Jesus had was not with sinners. It was with religious leaders. Those legalistic, out of shape, without the illumination of, of God, who did not understand how God works, they miss out on the visitation. It is the religious leaders who missed the point. Sometimes I've said it even from here, that doesn't matter how sincere you are, you can easily be sincerely wrong. Very. Some of these sincerely wrong people in other faiths can put us to shame in, to the, as far as commitment is concerned. They fast, they are committed, they even give, they are going to fight, they can even die for their wrong faith. Now how about us? Who have the deal? Who have the light of the world? Why should we not allow him to shed light in our hearts? Then we can see. So he brings illumination and one can therefore find his way through life without stumbling and hurting themselves. Light is actinic, it is carolific, it is luminiferous. Actinic has capacity to move even in a vacuum. Carolific, it has capacity to generate and produce energy and fire. Then it has the capacity to shed light, to see, to illuminate, so that darkness is moved back wherever God's light is. And however little the darkness is, light, rather the light is, darkness cannot stand it. By chasing away darkness and showing things the way they really are and where they are located, one can make sense out of their own existence. When you are in Christ, the light of the world, you also tap into this light. And you are able to see and to tell right and wrong. You are able to distinguish the things to eat and the things not to eat. You are able to distinguish your walk through life. You can tell this is a stone, potentially dangerous, I don't have to stumble. You either bypass it or walk over. I'm using that as a figure of speech. In practical terms, some of you, because you are walking in darkness, you sleep in the wrong bed. You sleep in the wrong bed. You eat the wrong food. You drink the wrong stuff. And then you wonder why you have lost your consciousness and sense of direction in life. You are fed on the wrong things. You are keeping wrong company. You are reading wrong letters. The directions in the course of life. You are reading posters of life wrongly. Because there is darkness in your heart, you cannot locate yourself and you cannot make sense out of your own existence. Light has calorific characteristics and can supply energy. Once concentrated, melting any icy situations, waters, 
and conditions in your heart and can even start a fire of revival in your heart. Some of us have very cold hearts. You are a moving civil war. <laughs> and people know it. If they can avoid you, that's why they, they, they are very careful around you. The heart, the light of the, of the world, Jesus, once he's resident, once he points in your heart, your icy hearts will melt. And you begin to bubble with joy and, and praise. Hallelujah. It can only happen if you allow him to operate in your life with freedom. So Jesus, as the light of the world, he is God's revelation. He has deliberately disclosed himself to us through his creation and ultimately through his son, who is the embodiment in that it has pleased God that the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus. If you want to see who God is, to know who God is, look at Jesus. It is he who fully discloses who God is, his heart, his mind, his ways, his plans, his God's salvation. He has a plan to spare us the effects and consequences of sin, of lostness, of barrenness, of confusion, consequences that would make us be very good custodian, or rather, very good candidates for hell. He brings God's salvation. He brings God's presence. Presence. Where there's light, where there's heat, God's presence does not leave situations as they are. They change. He's the agent who, demo who demonstrates God's grace. The undeserved favor. This woman who was caught, the Pharisees were going to stone him or to stone her to death. The prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, the father ran to see and embrace him because any villager who saw him first would stone him to death because he had despised his father and God's commandment. So darkness in people's hearts as a result of absence of God's light is expressed in a lot of ways. Ignorance of God's nature and his ways. And there are many, many people who are ignorant of God's nature and his ways, his purposes, his, his plans and his mind. They have written books, they have stated philosophies and statements over generations, but they are just ignorant. It is only this book that you can know who our God is, his nature, his ways, his purpose, his plans for our lives, and his mind. His mind about himself, his mind about you, and his mind about the enemy, the devil, Lucifer. Darkness in people's hearts is also expressed in rebellion, rebellion, since the fall, man has been rebellious. It only changes fashions. Rebellious by doubting God's word. Rebellious if, was the entry point of this rebellion, did God really say this? That is the beginning of rebellion. Once God's word does not find residence and space in your life, in my life, and you want to be independent of God and his rules and commandments that govern your life existence, rebellion takes over. Independence. I want to be my own man, my own woman. 
Nobody touching me, nobody limiting me. Another word for sin is called independence. Wanting to be independent of God. We were created to be totally dependent on him and to be interdependent one with another as we express love and commitment to each other. This absence of God's light, which brings life, results in death and inability to respond to the God's stimulus. When one is blind, the eyes, the organ of sight, cannot sense that the receptors cannot receive and interpret light. Unless one is born again, is given new organs of sight, is given a new heart, not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh, is given a new spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You keep groping in the dark, wondering why things happen the way they think they happen to you. You are walking in witchcraft and witchcraft and stumbling and falling and you wonder why things never work out for you because you are under judgment. You are independent of God, his ways, his mind. You are operating under a curse. Death, barrenness, unproductivity and eventually judgment and condemnation. This is terrible. God desires that we have life and live it and have it in its fullness. That the gifts he gave to you can be fully expressed, meeting needs and glorifying God. So since Jesus is the light of the world, therefore, keep your eyes fixed on him and follow him. You may be misunderstood. You may be criticized. It may not be the in thing, but you stand to gain if you follow him. The world may even walk a different path. Your peers may be pulling in a different direction. Stick to the way. Express your worship as a daily and dying experience to self and being raised to follow righteousness. So what are you going to do about him? If he is indeed the light of the world, the one who brings warmth and joy and peace, the one who sheds light and you can see the way through life, you don't stumble, you don't get lost, the one who can give you ability to avoid dangers on the way, what are you going to do about him? He has given you free will. You can actually choose, even to choose against him. But the consequences of our choices are already given. Those we don't choose, they are there. You can choose to ignore him. He's an inconvenience in your life. Before I accepted Christ, I feared two things. I knew he would inconvenience me because I knew what salvation meant. I saw my parents. So I said, ah, maybe, not, maybe later when I've tested life. I didn't want him to inconvenience me. I'd just joined the secondary school. We had not even gone to Geranyanji to dance. Now what are you talking about? Secondly, I feared having started, I'd seen somebody in our village who was once saved and he had backslidden and his life was worse. So I didn't want to be like the other one. So I said, maybe I delay until I'm about to die when there are very few possibilities of backsliding, then maybe. Yeah, you are losing out. So you can ignore him. It's possible to go through Uganda Christian University and for one reason or other, you get skilled at avoiding and ignoring, responding to these claims of God over your life. You can easily avoid chapel. You can easily avoid even people who are saved. You can even, 
deflect the message. He say, by the way, I am even better than those so-called. And there could be some that you really are better off. But you are living a dangerous life because you are walking in darkness. You can dismiss him. You can postpone the matter to a later time. But you know, you have no control over tomorrow. You can consign him to the dung hill of history and philosophize and explain him away and water his claims down as far as you are concerned and sum it up and say, inconsequential. Or you can give him audience and attention and say, how come? Everywhere I go, this one. Everywhere, even in university, how come? You can pay attention. You can give him space in your life, in your priorities, in your space of decision making. It is possible you can give him space. Many, many have done it, and their lives have been much better than they would otherwise have been. What you can never fully ignore when you are still on earth is to wash him away. Somehow he keeps coming. In the church, you hear. On radio, you hear. Some people may share testimony here. Some of you may even have dreams and visions. Whatever happens, there are people who you, you look at and their lives remind you there must be God who is operating in their lives because their lives are so good and so good examples and ambassadors of Christ you cannot ignore. Because, you see, ignoring him is trying to ignore one whom angels worship. That angels fall down. Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, all these are the archangels. And all the billions and billions of angels, once he stands, they fall down and worship him. Now, who are you? If angels worship him, you, 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 how many days, how many weeks have you had on, on earth? You count them. You know, if we live to be 70 years, how many weeks are those? You do the math. 70 years divided by how many weeks in a year? Hey, just count your years in weeks. You will see how. <laughs> in terms of eternity, one who was, who is, who is going to be. Now who should ignore the other? You ignore one for whom angels worship? You ignore the one who spoke the universe into space, into its being. I understand our sun is not the hottest star. That there are others that are much hotter than our sun. That they are still discovering galaxies and galaxies of space and other planets out there. We are not yet, we are not even the most significant planet. And yet, it has pleased him to send us his own son in whom his fullness of deity dwells to bring us a message. He treats us as important. I pray we take him as important also because this opportunity doesn't last forever. You can easily miss an opportunity. You can confine, the one who can confine entities into hell and the one you would choose to ignore, one from whom all blessings and good things flow, is the source of your life. We are breathing his oxygen free of charge. This COVID-19 has taught us God's oxygen is expensive. Some people have died and their bodies have been retained in hospitals because the bills are so high, families could not pay. Now, how much 
of God's oxygen have I breathed since my existence? A lot. If I were to pay for it, I definitely, what would I use? Because everything I am and I have is his. This light, this sun, which we enjoy, we, and he gave us even the capacity to filter it naturally with the blacks. We filtered it without buying eh, stuff. We, Uganda, God gave us a beautiful country. Beautiful country. Yesterday, I fed on beans that I planted in my garden. 60 days, the beans are ready. Hey. God gives us beautiful things. He wants us to live and enjoy him and glorify him. We just need to make a decision. You can't ignore him and have peace, have joy, have your sins forgiven, have your, your, your woes cease, and you have your eternal destiny assured. You cannot do that. Some of us are moving civil wars. We ignore you because we know in your circle, you suck life out of us. You are so negative. So negative. Nothing seems to, to excite you. You blame your tribe. You blame your clan. You blame your family. You, eh. Nothing seems to be good around about you. And uh, you blame the government. Of course, you blame the university. Eh. But hello. Moving civil war. Anything when we touch you, you will explode. You need the joy of the Lord in your heart. It is He who makes a difference. Once He diffuses the tension in your life, you will be walking free. No nagum kono. Throwing your arm freedom because your sins have been forgiven. You've been set free. You are born again. It is dangerous to ignore him. It pays to receive him. He says, come to me, let us reason together. He's not scared of what you bring to him in discussion on the table. He's experienced in fixing lives. Amen. And you are not better. He fixes lives of murderers, prostitutes, thieves, terrorists, all grades and tribes of sinners, He's able to fix. Some are written for us in the Bible. He casts out every demon, cannot stand his presence. So what is your witchcraft about? That auntie is bewitching him, you come to Jesus, you will see. Your angels of, God, uh, of, of protection will be on duty concerning you. Amen. Though your sins are as red as crimson, they can be as white as snow. Though your list of regrets is very long, he can wipe it clean. Regrets, regrets, because of your bad decision making. There's a woman who was living a very difficult life. She had carried out very many abortions. She wasn't sure whether they were 11 or 13. Her own. And depression set in, regret set in. And when she was conceiving, she was excited. Life was, hey, she was very busy happening. Now the reality had caught up with her. Finally, she came to Jesus. He wiped her slate clean, forgave her. Now she's a preacher of the gospel. And she's not ashamed to explain and to tell the freedom she has in Christ. <laughs> Though you are tired and defeated, he can power you into life, into success, into prosperity. Just receive him and receive him now. I would like to invite my brother, Paul, to make the invitation to you. I want to give you an opportunity. May God bless you.